must be. Just had to bless up the place with that Buju Banton and, of course, Gramps Morgan. You are inside the No Morning Show here on TTT, and it's just about 22 minutes after the hour of 7 o'clock. And we are going to be looking at the economy, especially the COVID-19 impact on the economy, whether it's economically, the numbers, whether, you know, mental health. We want to have the discussion, and in studio with us this morning to do that is economist Dr. Marlene Atz, who... If you all don't know her, well, something wrong with you. You really should, because she's that good. Good morning to you, Dr. Atz. Good morning, Natalie. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you so much for being here with us. You're most welcome. So the latest restrictions, I mm. think it's one of those things, you know, some people, we talk about lockdown fatigue. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about the numbers, how businesses are being affected, the economy, how much money we've borrowed, the, jet, the debt to GDP ratio. It's just so much. But let us just start with these latest measures and what do you think the fallout of that, these uh, latest reimposition of restrictions will be? All right. I think one of the things I'd like us to do in terms of the conversation is look at the restrictions because you're right. People have, in fact, been suffering from some kind of lockdown fatigue. Yeah. Um, but some of it is imposed, or some of it is self-imposed. And I think we have to be honest and we have to be introspective and take some responsibility for the measures that we're seeing now. Um, what has happened is that, of course, the numbers, we did so well last year when we started. I think people got into, lulled into a sense of complacency, for want of a better word. And as the holidays loomed, we're no longer able to travel, all of these things. So yeah. people took the opportunity to palance a little bit, as we say in, you know, um, in, the, in the local jargon. And especially so, for the Easter especially season. Especially for the Easter season. So, I mean, it is understandable. It is not quite um, Stockholm Syndrome, but, you know, being locked in and that sort of thing and not having the opportunity to socialize takes its toll on persons. So I think we went, and I'm using the royal we here, we went overboard a little bit over the holidays, and now we're seeing the result of that. And, of course, the result is twofold. The numbers have increased, and, of course, the government has been forced to impose, yeah. to re, well, to reintroduce re yeah. um, some of those lockdown measures. And the immediate impact is going to be, of course, on people in the service industry. Um, some of the more vulnerable, the people who have been subjected to some volatility yeah. since last March, um, and women among those. So you're going to restaurants, um, Primarily the person who will serve you is a female, sometimes single-headed household, but you so also have the male. So there might be some gender-based inequality are some, with how, that's how we're correct. affected. So there is some gender-based dimension to what those impacts will be. And when we talk about the impacts of, of COVID-19 generally and also the lockdown specifically, I'd like to say that there are some tiers of impacts. So you're going to have the individual impacts and you're going yeah. to have these primarily still fairly youthful persons who are going to become unemployed. Um, some of them, as I mentioned, they're going to be single heads of households, either male or female, but predominantly female in our, in our particular context. Um, younger persons, the impact it's going to have on their children. Remember, these women and men, these single parents, are already perhaps leaving their children at home to mm -hmm. do online schools. So it's a catch-22 situation. So you become unemployed. Um, the money you may have been paying someone to watch your child while he or she's online or to, you, to pay your internet so that they can get on to school. I mean, there are a number of domino yes. impacts from this. It is not a quick and easy, and neither is it a quick and easy. It's a complex problem, but the solutions also are complex and multi-tiered. Um, so those are going to be the immediate impacts. When the central bank released its data in January, um, its economic bulletin in January, it actually reflected some of the unemployment that we were seeing starting to grow in the mm -hmm. economy based on reported numbers. There are a number of these, numbers. There are a number of these in state, formal yeah. sectors and in formal forms of unemployment. And I don't mean illegal here, I mean things that are not reported. So you might be working in a restaurant or you may have been working in a bar, even though you're not allowed to sit in the bar, you might be serving in the bar. Yeah. There are these things, so you may not necessarily report everybody that you're employing. So in terms of the formal numbers that were employed um, and that were reported as having lost their jobs, the central bank reported that that had increased in January. We know that that is a the little more significant. Will be a lot more than we has know. Been we know yeah. that. We know. We know that intuitively the numbers are going to be a little more significant than the central bank will actually able to capture in a, in a formal sense. So there are those impacts, they're the impacts that we've seen from March to now in terms of things reported in the, in the news in different forms of the media, 
children are not going to school. So there are those other kinds of impacts. Mm -hmm. So your mother or your father becomes unemployed. They don't have the money to pay the internet. So it's not transportation costs anymore because they're not going anywhere physically. But it's the internet that has to be paid, the light bill that has to be paid, the instrument that has to be purchased, whether you have to put data on your phone, how, whatever instrument. So, so yeah. there are a number of these complex issues that we really have to get to. Um, but, but, but moving forward, there are, of course, the larger, when you move from that micro-individualistic household sort of um, scenario, then you come to the economics piece yeah. where things are, are really very awkward and challenging for the government because and, and was even before COVID-19 and was even before and you hear um, last year when we started in, in terms of the the COVID-19 measures the Minister of Finance um, essentially rose to a Herculean challenge and try to bring some stability to the economy in terms of the payouts that were being given um, the engagement with the with the private sector in terms of the banks etc yeah um, but the picture is not has not improved and is not likely to improve anytime soon um, the and, the, and yet the IMF was predicting that the growth for Trinidad and Tobago for 2021 would be about 2.1 percent well, well I think the IMF if I, if I may try to put that in context I don't work at the IMF of course but if I could try to put that in context I think what the IMF has been doing and they've revised it in January and they further revised it in March they are linking correctly so i think the global growth projections to the yeah. rollout of vaccines so the more advanced economies and that's a conversation that i want us to to pay attention to in trinidad and tobago the more advanced economies so your china's your european union your great britain your united states of america they are all reporting more robust growth projection rates for 2021 and 2022 and by that I mean things the light they're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel but that light that they're seeing at the end of their tunnel is linked to the fact that they've been rolling out very aggressively vaccines right. so should you're Caribbean talking countries even be compared to that should, should we not the same I don't think we being, should be compared by the same I don't think stick. we should be compared at all um, because those countries have the financial wherewithal to buy millions of vaccine I mean the the United States is now reporting that at least 50% of their population, 100, more than 100 million yep. people, have received their first dose of some vaccine. In because England, they have over in 32 England, million and, first and, dose and uh, over 10 million second dose. Absolutely. In the United States, 32% of their population have had both of their doses already. Yeah. So the United States is almost ready to open their doors to global business. Ditto for China, ditto for some, some of the countries in the European Union. That is not to say that they are COVID-free, but they have so, quote-unquote, inoculated themselves that they feel fairly comfortable opening up their economies. Yeah. That is not the case for us in the Caribbean. And I think we need to take, we need to distill, or we ought to distill a couple messages from what is happening in the global picture. So the IMF has predicted 2 point, 2 point plus um, percent um, growth rate for us, which I think is, in fact, overly optimistic, certainly for Trinidad and Tobago. We know that the main source of our economic growth is from the oil and gas sector. Even though the prices are looking a bit better than yes, compared to last year. but production has declined significantly. Yes. So it means the net impact for us, the overall impact for us, is not going to be particularly buoyant or particularly promising. And coupled with that sort of very dim perspective um, in terms of the energy sector, is the fact that government still has to find financial resources. The Minister of Finance... A um, couple months ago, said that he needs 3.5 billion dollars a month to meet mandatory payments. We're not earning revenue. He's actually yeah. doing a lot of borrowing. He has gotten fairly close to 100 percent in terms of his borrowing. Yeah. But we are in uncharted waters. We're in unprecedented times. He also needs to find money to buy vaccines because if we were to extract from what is happening in the global space that economic recovery is going to be linked to the rollout of vaccines and yeah. economic growth, it means that we need to essentially follow suit. That's one of the things that we would need to take pattern from. And while I'm not here to advocate on behalf of the Ministry of Health or to advocate for vaccines or anything like that, that is, a, that is outside of my area of subject matter expertise, it certainly stands to reason that we need to be paying attention to vaccines and we need to be paying attention and reducing 
the narrative around vaccine hesitancy because it is not going to get the economy back to where we want it to be. So right. all of the people who are being displaced, all of the lockdown measures, all of the businesses that are being closed, all of the economic um, challenges that we are feeling, each of us are feeling it in different ways. And the economic challenge can come from the fact that you really kind of feel that you need to go to the beach. And you need to go to a bar and drink a beer. And, you know, you'd like to be able to go have out and have fight. dinner. Yeah. You know, you'd need to go out the road and engage in some old talk. Watch some football in a bar. Those kinds of things. All of us are feeling it in different ways. And we really have to understand that in order for us to get back to some level of, of steady state, um, we have to part of that vaccine. conversation has to include not just the fiscal and monetary policies, some of which we implemented last year, to ease the burden on people who might have become unemployed or for whom who have gone into furloughs or whose jobs might be threatened. Um, and I think that's one of the conversations that, that, that perhaps the Minister of Finance may need to have again, talking to banks in terms of how they... They, you know, they ease up yeah. a little bit because on, on the clients. Because 2021 definitely has not been easier than 2020. No, it has not. I think we were, if you were to see it as part of a learning curve, so to speak, some kind of curve, yeah, we're, we're still, still, going, up. We're still yeah. going up. And not in terms of the numbers per se, but in terms of our the understanding impact. Yeah, and, the, and impact. the impact. And therefore, for us to come to some kind of recovery, we're going to have to peak in terms of collectively suffering through COVID-19. Yeah. Um, and making some decisions along the way, individual and both at the micro, the, mac, the micro level at the individual level, but also nationally, we're going to have to be making some decisions moving forward. Let's talk about the national level because we saw we saw the the borrowing that the Ministry mm -hmm. of Finance has done. Because, but the thing is, as you said, most of our money would come from oil and gas. Mm -hmm. That is depressed, whether it's mm -hmm. through production or through prices. Sure, and then. We would have tourism, which would seem to be the kind of follow-up, but somehow the borders are closed, so then we can't get the, the foreign exchange from that. Mm -hmm. Where can the government go? What can it really do to kind of try to start turning things around outside of the vaccination? Because we are lagging behind realistically with that, just because not because we are not trying to vaccinate sure. people, but because of demand and supply yes, and, and the affordability yeah. factor. I think. One of the things the government has to seriously contemplate, um, one, continue the borrowing. Um, unfortunately, that is, that's just the reality that we're facing. Um, and also perhaps contemplate external help. Um, there continues to be, globally, but more so in the region, coming out of our experience with the multilateral agencies um, back in the 1980s when several of the Caribbean countries went through periods of structural adjustment, there continues to be that residual um, hesitancy um, in terms of those policies that were implemented. There is a global plan afoot for developing countries. Let me just stick a pin there, Natalie. The challenge, one of the challenges for Nan Tobago is that because of our windfalls from the oil and gas sector over the years, we are not quite categorized as a low-income country. We're categorized as a ah, high-income country. And that is a catch-22. So inside, 22. precisely, yes. inside of there is a catch-22 for Trinidad and Tobago. So there needs to be globally a rethinking in terms of how Trinidad and Tobago is categorized because that is almost an illusion because our source of wealth, quote unquote, our wealth, is from a non-renewable source of a source of source of money. Yeah. All right. So our oil has declined. Natural gas. We still have some natural gas finds. Some new information coming in terms of the natural gas sector, etc. But Trinidad and Tobago's permanent income in terms of our long-term trajectory is not one that should put us in the category of a high income, income country. And I remember Gaston Brown is, you know, talking about that mm -hmm. when last year I had an interview with him, just looking at the COVID-19 pandemic mm -hmm. and how it would have affected small island states. And sure. we're seeing that when he reached out to these big people like the IMF and the mm -hmm. World Bank and stuff, that the response was that it was considered a high income country yes. just based on what yeah. each household, the cost of living was and what they were Precisely. getting. And he was and saying that. Capita, GDP, he read, the, that's right. right. Yeah. And he mm -hmm. was saying that that's not the reality on no. the ground, though. And I think Trinidad and Tobago falls into that. So yeah. how does it reconcile that where it can reach out to these, you know, the, these entities for loans or for money, but at affordable rates based on the reality? 
And I think now is an opportune time. I, I say to some of my colleagues that it's a fairly good time to be an economist. It's always a good time, I think. <laughs> but I think now it's an excellent time to be an economist because it gives you the chance to reimagine our craft. So how do you redefine small island developing states and particularly a small island developing states that has a history and a socioeconomic landscape such as Trinidad and Tobago? Um, that landscape requires, well, certainly came with some underlying tenets that says, okay, well, Trinidad and Tobago's per capita GDP is significantly higher than the others because, you know, it's getting oil and gas. Climate change, depressed oil prices, declining oil reserves. The fact that the United States is now run by an administration that is very clear in terms of their commitment to climate change. So they are, in fact, possibly going to swing the pendulum away from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you recall last year, Natalie, March, April, we actually witnessed negative prices. People did not yes, want... The, people the, did not want... The WTI they price They wanted to dump zero, precisely. Yes. And that... But the Brent, funny enough, the Brent held crew, a little held bit. A little yeah. bit. But it certainly signals to us, um, countries like Trinidad and Tobago that are, that are price takers, that we are no longer in control. I mean, we never really had control, but the pendulum is swinging away from economies such as ours in terms of that windfall mm -hmm. that we were expecting. So it is incumbent on us, therefore, to do things differently. And I think one of the things that I've suggested is that we need to think, one, we need to engage with the multilateral agencies. Um, head on, but be very clear in terms of what our conversation is going to be. Yeah. You cannot look at us in the same way as you have done traditionally. Yes, our per capita GDP suggests that our standard of living is high, but the reality is, and come with your data to support your argument. So I think there has to be some renegotiation and some global contract in terms of how the multilaterals treat with small island developing states, mm -hmm. particularly small island developing states in the Caribbean. You have COVID-19, you have depressed economies. So whether it's tourism, the commodity-based or the service-based industries, they're Art both suffering, suffering yeah. in the Caribbean. So it's, it's COVID-19, it's high debt-to-GDP ratios that we've traditionally had. Crime. It's, it's crime. It is volcanic, volcanic eruptions. eruptions. It is a hurricane season coming around, this, yeah. coming around the corner. So I think it is an opportune time for us to collectively we we now have the opportunity we have the chair of caricom not too far from where we sit yeah. um now is an opportune time for, for, for caricom to essentially raise those conversations because it is not one island or two islands it is the entire region that is going to reel from these multiple threats so to speak so that's the first thing the second thing i think for us in the caribbean and certainly starting with trinidad and tobago is that we need to embrace ourselves some form of structural adjustment and by that I mean and I always want to and qualify this is the individual responsibility the individual countries responsibility oil and gas will continue to play a part in our economic landscape but not the kind that it did but in not the 90s the, so we therefore need to recalibrate we need to reimagine what our new future is going to look like whether that new future is going to look at green fuels, it's going to look at a green economy. But we have to be very clear in our minds what that is going but to you look think like. Chinese are even prepared to adjust their standard of living to the reality of the situation? I think we are still challenged to wrap ourselves around the reality of what we're facing. And I think until and unless we embrace our reality and embrace our truth in terms of where we are, we are going to be challenged in Trinidad and Tobago. But I also want to make the point that we, we continue to see this as a role for the government alone, and the government does have a responsibility. That is what they lobbied for and they, you know, they, they campaigned for. And any government that comes, into, comes in to, to lead the country has yes. a responsibility. But each of us as citizens, as we're seeing now in terms of the COVID spike, we, we are we are part. the ones who are responsible yeah. for that. So I think we also have to play our part in terms of how we navigate moving forward yeah. and how the economy re recovers and how we as citizens recover with the economy moving forward. Dr. Ads, unfortunately, you realize we're out of time. Yes, but I thank realize. Thank you so, so, so you much most for welcome. being with us here this morning you and for sharing welcome. your wealth of knowledge. But You're remember, you have an individual responsibility because there's so much that the government can do and no more. All right, we're going to take that break and we'll be right back with the No Morning Show.